Greetings, beloved ones. I hope you are doing as well as you can be at this moment in time. I'm Larry Ward, Dr. Larry Ward, and my pleasure to be with you for the first time or before now. This is a magical time of the year in the Northern Hemisphere that has been celebrated around the earth for centuries, from China to Japan to Europe and all the countries there. The sun stands still. I'm here in Cretero, Santiago de Cretero, Mexico. Peggy's already mentioned the indigenous history here, which is rich of many tribal peoples. This is also part of the home of the Mexican Revolution, which was just celebrated recently for Independence Day. A poem for you. It's cold here now. It may be colder where you are, but we are here together. The darkness outside our windows, wrapping our bones with vastness that can mirror the dark inside. The dark night of the soul, perhaps, the absence of certainty, but maybe certainty is no longer an effort required. Dwelling in blessed assurance is my refuge. I find it everywhere. The sun is coming more, yes, but it has never gone away. Even in the center of black holes, we find light. The path is clear, the earth, the rhythm is eternal. In the ancient times, it was encouraged to look within for the illumination that already lives within you. With light now shining maybe for you on this past year at this precious time, Whatever your life has been as an experience this past year, however sad, however painful, however joyous, it is your precious life singing its song. Smiling to you in the dark, a radiant light that gets brighter in stillness and in celebration, and in reverence, and oh yes, in the joy that does not disappoint us, the joy of liberation. Let us continue with the rising sun to shine our own light everywhere. One of the great qualities of light and dark is they shine equally <laughs> and don't shine equally. Um, the dark is available for everyone on our planet and so is the light. It is full of equanimity, dark and light mirrors, some say, of one another, close siblings, others say, others focus on the paradox they represent, both outside of us and within us. Carl Jung was of the strong opinion that the future of humanity will depend on how well we deal with the darkness inside of ourselves. I think it's not easy to embrace uh, all of our capacities, all of our tendencies, 
that requires a level of self-awareness that can be on a daily basis excruciating <laughs> is how I find it but I also find within it that which was excruciating melting away fading away into the stream of ancient goodness of which I am a part with you this moment of the darkness and the old phrase and and is not put out the light this is an important practice to remember within oneself as well as when we look outside of ourselves into the world we now live in our nervous systems are programmed to by evolution to remember what is most scary and most negative the most <laughs> and for good reason survival but because of that we tend to override uh what is not negative our news media dwells on the negative many of our conversations dwell on what is not working and there's plenty not working <laughs> and there's plenty that is negative what I'm trying to say is to remember what we pay attention to with our mind shapes our mind. And from a neuroscience point of view, we think it takes five times as much attention on what is positive to balance one negative in terms of your attention and its impact on your neural structure and your nervous bio system biology this is why you can have a whole great day at work or at home and go out for a drive and one person can ruin your day one moment one expression one gesture one comment conscious or unconscious that's not the point i'm trying to make i'm trying to make the point of how much attention we need to pay to what nourishes us what cares for us, what keeps our own fire alive within us. We will not get where we want to be in this world, or we want our children or generations to come to be, of not just humans, but all species, to be without us taking a bold evolutionary step in learning how to let down our defenses so that we can actually figure out the, what to do together about the mess we are in. This to me is part of the message of the solstice. We are much in the dark about one another because mostly all we know about one another, we don't know <laughs> about one another. We know about stories about one another, but we have often, most often never met as unique species on this planet. The dark represents also what is not there, what is absent. As you think back over your last year, almost your last year in this calendar framework, what is not there anymore in your life? No blame, no judgment, just what's not there? What is absent? What has faded into the ocean of time? What have you already let go of in the best sense of letting go is not clinging to that's one of the practices i've been doing with myself this last week and will continue until into the new year what 
I have a birthday coming up next month that's not meant to be an announcement. Uh, but I've been experiencing that I still have potential. Uh, I have present potential. And so one of the questions I'd like for you to meditate on for yourself during this time we are in is what is your present potential? What do you still have the capacity to bring into this world? However small does it make a difference because what we know from the Yin tradition of Buddhism is inside the very small is the very large. How else could a Buffalo boy from Vietnam become Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh? And inside every small person, every human being, every plant, animal, and mineral is the very large, even in a speck of dust. This is the light that's available in the darkness, where we can see, where we can touch windows of illumination into our precious life, into our experience. But also, I know thinking about what's absent in your life now may bring up grief, sorrow, anger, fear, joy, gratitude, peace, enthusiasm. The whole spectrum of human emotion flows through all of us all the time every molecule of it. And sometimes these molecules dance together. Sometimes they dance separately and become very dominant in our experience of being human. But it is all our experience of the miracle of a precious life. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of the the work on the dark night of the soul by John of the Cross. I don't mean to go Catholic on you or anything, but uh, it's a text I'm familiar with that I've studied and taught. And this, a lot of us have this understanding confused that the, the dark night of, what, of the soul <laughs> is because you're getting closer to the light. <laughs> It's not that the light's going out, it's that it's so bright. It looks dark. And so whatever suffering you may be in at this moment, I may be in, and we are in together. It's important to know that it is one, impermanent. Two, it is empty of a separate self-entity. It does not exist by itself. My suffering does not exist by itself, and neither does my joy. And knowing this, I am able to live free without being stuck in comparison, though I notice differences without being stuck in aversion while knowing there are things I prefer. <laughs> without being trapped in the prison of ignorance, meaning in myself, there is beloved community. And because there is beloved community in me, there is beloved community in you. There is beloved community between us and all beings. Earth, sky, air, water, sunshine. Oh boy, we can't do without any, any of these things. How could we forget them? It is so easy to forget in the modern world quote-unquote, modern world. We're so busy 
going nowhere that we forget how precious our lives are and sometimes almost until it's too late. The solstice is a time to remember that we need not fear the dark once we are able to recognize the dark in ourselves. We need not fear the light once we can recognize the light in ourselves. It's just so often hidden and buried so deep within us. When it's on, we don't even recognize it. Take good care of your light. One of the wonderful qualities of light in particular, I'm thinking of a candle. You can light one candle and then light another candle off of the flame of that other candle and neither candle is diminished. We can share our own light and it does not diminish the light. It does not diminish our light. If we could just learn this one thing as humanity. I'm thinking of uh, one of the books in the New Testament's coming, the book of John, and uh, all the other testaments are all stories about Jesus and the miracles and all of that, the crucifixion, etc. But the book of John raises a different question. If all the other books in the New Testament are pointing to Jesus, saying, that's it, that's the way, that's the dude, as my mother would say. <laughs> the book of John says, well, who are you? The issue is not that the light is over there. The issue is that the light that was over there was trying to tell you the light is here. <laughs> the light is here in you. And you over-personalize it. You missed the message. So it's not issue a issue for me as a Buddhist teacher to, to uh, not recognize my teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, who recently passed away. But it is for me to remember. I've been asked over oh, many years ago, what does Thich Nhat Hanh think about this or that? Because I spent so much time with him. And I always said, and I still say, I don't know, <laughs> ask him. Yeah, but if you want to know what I think about something, ask me. My point is this, we are the light. If we are or have been practitioners in Thich Nhat Hanh tradition, wonderful. Any other tradition, wonderful, no tradition. Wonderful. Nevertheless, we're all continuations of his emphasis on wisdom and compassion and action in our world. This time of the year, many of us start to think about, well, what we did wrong <laughs> in the last year, where we blew it, <laughs> where where the bowling ball didn't go where we wanted <laughs> when we let it go down the alley. That happens in human life. No justification, it just happens. So how do we begin anew? How do we uh, let go of our mistakes and not let them define our future. One of the ways that, <clears throat> there are many ways in, in different spiritual traditions to do this symbolically. Uh, but what I've been learning to do is from multiple sources in, in Buddhist history is to, I don't, talk to Larry about the mistakes I have made 
unless I'm in the company of other beings. And I mean that energetically. So when I want to talk about how much of a smuck I've been in the last year, before I do that, before I go there, <laughs> I have a meditation where I call in my avatars, my archetypes, my mentors, living or dead, fictional or real. And I surround myself with their energy and support, recognizing my present potential in the moment. And then and only then am I able to truthfully acknowledge that I've been terrible in this last year in communicating with people individually. That's correct. <laughs> and, uh, but now having said that, and you're my holy beings at this moment as my witnesses, I am able to see my way, see the light of my way forward, step by step, person by person. And there's not that many people I need to catch up with, communicate with. Maybe that's true for you. Maybe it's a family member that you've been out of touch with. You need to reconnect to. You need to share your light with. The whole point of the Bodhisattva vow in Buddhism is to share our light, to generate our light, to care for our light so that we can share it with others. And that sharing does not have to be verbal. This is very important to me. The sharing of light is first energetic because that's what light is. <laughs> and and you, you know this, you've experienced this. You've been with people when you were with them, you felt enthusiastic, calm, clear, or maybe there are people you've been with before and all of us, you find yourself being very calm, very very relaxed. Or others, it could, it could all be one person, others, people you're with, and all of a sudden you're able to laugh again. All of a sudden joy starts way down in your stomach and bubbles up through your throat. Know who these people are in your life and take care of that relationship. Share the light, but also be able to receive it. So many of us have been caught in the self-esteem complex of being less than. We have not able to recognize, even see our own light or the power of our own light of compassion and wisdom and action. The other thing that I want you to notice about what has been absent in this past year, this is at a deeper level somewhat. When you think about this past year, can you remember when your mind was not occupied with greed? even for a moment. And if you can, you should rejoice because all you have to do is repeat that. <laughs> if you've had a moment in this past year where you and you're not preoccupied with the energies of hatred or aversion, even only for a moment, Go back, remember the moments of that. What did it taste like? What did it smell like? What did it look like? Where were you? What colors were in the room? People in the room, what activities were going on? Savor that moment and internalize it. Take care of it like a plant, like a small bird you want to take good care of. Nourish that non-hate. Nourish that non-greed. A uh, story about Martin Luther King in his last days came up uh, for me just now. And 
Uh, I heard this from Andrew Young, who we were out at dinner uh, one time. And on the, mom on the morning Martin was assassinated, he had woke up before everyone else, got his pillow, because everybody slept in the same room for safety uh, reasons. So Ralph Abernathy was there, Andy Young was there, et cetera. And Martin got up, grabbed his pillow, and went over to Ralph Abernathy's bed and hit him on the head and said, Ralph, wake up. I'm not hating anybody today. Isn't it wonderful? And then he went over and hit Andy on the head and saw around the room saying the same thing. I'm not hating anybody today. Isn't it wonderful? Remember those moments in your life. Mindfulness is recognizing what is not there as well as what is there. And this is what the dark and the light teaches us at every moment. And when in this past year have you tasted the joy of beloved community, safe community, miraculous relations with the natural world. When have you tasted these experiences in this last year? In the air, in the wind, touching the earth with your feet or your hands in the garden? Just what a wonder it is. to be human and be conscious of our humanness. Our great challenge now, of course, is how we be this consciousness altogether in the sense of energy, not in the sense of dogma, in the sense of the light that never diminishes when shared, not in the sense of social organization, deeper than that. In fact, our social organization dilemma is, is based on not having gone deep enough in our understanding of our own humanness. That's all. In that sense, it's not that complicated. <laughs> kind of a joke. But every society in history that has even had a moment of collective well-being, that collective well-being socially is reflected in a spiritual collective well-being underneath that sociality. Check it yourself. Spirituality and sociality are not separated. They're profoundly connected, just like our nervous systems are profoundly connected to our interactions with and in society. So is our quality of consciousness. Make sure you have the music around you that helps you get calm, get joyous, rejoice, breathe easy, touch beauty. Make sure you have the art around you, even if it's only one picture that when you look at it, you have a sense of the profundity of being human, your own present potential in the present moment. Learn how to do things in the dark that you've never done before. Years ago, we were in uh, Korea at a monastery that was known for training the most successful abbots for thousands of years. It was way up in the mountains and it was below 20 below zero or more most of the time at the time of year we were there and we lived there for a week. But when we arrived, we got a tour of the monastery grounds and the abbot took us into a room, took us into a building 
inside that building was one room. Uh, it didn't have any Buddha statue, uh, no flowers. It had one object, that object was a mirror. And the abbot looked at us all in the eye and said, advanced practice. <laughs> this is learning how to look at ourselves with compassion, not just looking for critique, which is how we've been trained to see what flaws we have, to see what our shortcomings are. Always ask yourself, whose definition of shortcomings is this? <laughs> and where did this come from? Or you will hold yourself back. It's great to see the number of people around the world, across the generation, to our doing things we thought previously were impossible. 20 years ago, whoever would have imagined dear Greta Thunberg? Who would have imagined that? We can be thankful she had the courage to come out of the dark into the light and to share her light with the rest of us. And it's millions of people around the world every day like her, not just in ecological responsibility, other areas of social and economic and political responsibility. But we have, haven't quite have the systems to lift these people up. Um, yeah, I think that's, part of what I'm saying. We, we need to tell we need to tell some good stories about one another. You know, we're a story-making creature. Of course, advertising has known this for years, but uh, in their new science research departments, but we're story-making creatures. And our stories influence our behaviors. So we need to be telling a whole lot of new and different stories than stories of doom and gloom, of greed, of hatred, and of ignorance of the deep connection we all have on this precious planet. Tell the new stories, write the children books, write new songs, paint, dance, roll in the mud, <laughs> whatever you do that can help us all remember how precious this life is how precious every life is. And when we remember, as our ancestors have remembered, no matter their horror or difficulties or suffering, the light still shines. You can trust it. But greet it in yourself every day. I've added to my nighttime meditation to imagine I'm sitting in the middle of my chair here, here in the office, Peggy's office or mine, and I close my eyes and I imagine a circle around me of friends and loved ones. And then I imagine another circle of friends and associates and my circle keeps getting bigger and bigger until it goes beyond the human realm into the dogs I've loved before <laughs> and on to other beings and the ducks I used to live near with and the deer and, and all of a sudden, I know where I am. So learn how to create a field of merit for yourself. That's just a, a small example a feel of goodness, uh, like people who are really good gamblers, I've learned have the ability to construct a mental palace of the cards. And while the cards are changing, they're deconstructing the palace. 
of the 52. That's quite a cognitive skill. We must learn how to do the same with the palace of our hearts so that our light is never diminished, never withheld. Because remember, sharing the light does not diminish it in any way, does not diminish mine, does not diminish yours. I want to end with a poem. Another poem. I know that for some of you, you may feel like your life is in fragments. This poem is for you. And of course, all of our lives are in fragments <laughs> if we look at it that way. The most beautiful lamp I ever saw was made from pieces of glass left on the floor at the end of the day in the artist's workshop. The pieces sparkle yet remain hidden until seen as pieces of a dance of colors and light with tender hands of a full heart reconstituted singing the brilliance of new wholeness hey you on this day look down at the floor of your life of your heart see the pieces of pain and joy lying on the floor waiting for you but do not be disheartened because things are broken. With tender care and patience, take up these pieces with the hands of a full heart. Take these pieces of your precious life and beauty make. Make beauty for yourself and in so make beauty for us all. So now if you could, again, be as comfortable as you can, I'm gonna lead a short meditation on creating a field of merit, uh, it would be called in some Buddhist circles. This is like the palace of the gambler, though I'm not suggesting that. This is learning how to construct in your own mind a refuge that when you step into it, both your heart and your mind find calmness, find peace, find nourishment and potential. So first begin to get in touch with the sensation of your breathing. Noticing the in-breath. Noticing the out breath. And noticing the in between breath. And now see if you can relax a little more into that breath. Circle cycle of life. Making sure your shoulders are relaxed. Your neck is not stiff or stuck, it's fluid. You can literally feel the rising and falling of your abdomen. And then imagine appearing around you 
a circle of loving kindness. People, plants, animals that may have gifted you with loving kindness in your experience with them. Let the human faces and body shapes become more prominent so you can offer them a smile. And around that circle, mentors, teachers, guides, pastors, preachers, religious leaders, social leaders, ecological leaders around you. Lifting up your own good heart. Reminding you of your potential, your possibility, remaining still in every moment of your life. And further out in the circle of Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Buddhas around you, mystical beings in a further circle out, feel supported by the whole energy spectrum of consciousness. And let the light of that gathering shine within you and on you. Let the light penetrate your cells. all your organs, bones, tissues, neurons, muscles, toes, whole body. And relaxing now into the light. Without effort. Recognize the sensation of safety you feel at this moment. Now follow each breath, each in-breath, each out-breath, back to full awareness of where your body is at this moment, at this time. Move slowly as you look around your space, the walls and windows and ceilings and floors. Notice your breath is still easy and calm. This is just one example of such kind of contemplation. Please experiment and invent as many as you can for yourself so that you always have a sense of access to what Carolyn Meist would call access to a floor in a building that is the penthouse and not the first floor.
even though we live on all these floors of consciousness, learning how to access the penthouse gives us perspective on all the other floors as we practice our liberation. Thank you. May the merit of this practice benefit all beings, benefit all beings and, bring peace. and bring peace.